Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to our final more lecture for this year. Because of some rescheduling, we have two more lectures next year. Um, but this is the last one this year. And it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Joseph Bobulia, uh, presently from Victoria University and soon to be from the University of Auckland. Um, Joseph is going to talk today about religious studies in New Zealand, but what makes him particularly well positioned for this is because I think he's probably the second eldest in religious studies after Paul Morris. Maybe not in terms of age, but at least he's been around a while. Uh, but what's interesting about Joseph is that although he was trained in sort of classic religious studies department at Princeton, he has moved in all kinds of different directions um, and has really become an expert in a lot of different things from within Victoria, from within a religious studies department. So about 10 years ago or so, he taught himself neuroscience. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, he taught himself uh, complex statistical methods. So he has this sort of really strong grounding in religious studies, but also this, uh, these other expertise in different fields that makes him particularly well positioned to talk about religious studies place within the academy. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Joseph Bobulia. Thanks. So yeah, I want to thank, uh, actually, before I get on to that, just to thank uh, uh, Will for the invitation to speak. It was initially going to be a kind of pessimistic, possibly pessimistic uh, lecture about the final 20 years of religious studies. It's just, that's it. Um, and in and, and part, a review of, of some of the work that's uh, been taking place um, in kind of newer horizons. And uh, instead, I'm just really filled with a whole lot of optimism. And I see just, in part, engaging with some of uh, Albie Moore's ideas, just a lot of uh, consistency. Um, so the, the topics, uh, the, I guess, uh, the tone of the talk will be just a bit different. Um, but thank you for the invitation. I'll try to be provocative, because uh, Albie would have liked that. And uh, I think you will, too. Um, I went digging around for uh, letters from Albie, because I, I recall getting one or two in the early days. He was such an engaged person. So like, he had just this incredible open mind. And, and, and I remember meeting him uh, at the NZAVS, uh, NZASR conference um, in 2000. And uh, some of you were there. I think Greg was there. I remember you very vividly. Um, uh, in, in Nelson, no, you were yeah, you know, holding forth and, and saying very smart things, and I was surrounded by people I took to be very clever, but also very down to earth. It was um, a small and tightly connected and extremely friendly and open-minded community. And Albie followed up after my talk, which was I had not even defended my dissertation at this point, and uh, took a, took a real interest in some of the work I was doing on um, evolution and religion and um, is just a, a great model for how to be uh, an academic. I was just looking, uh, as I was digging through these letters, and I didn't find the kind of key letter yet, um, but uh, I did find the, um, the initial announcement. Uh, and you can imagine that $12 per person for the backpacker cabin. I remember at the time, it was like $5 US, and I couldn't believe how cheap everything was um, uh, then. Um, I did find this letter, which, um, was characteristic of Albie. He, he, um, he was just sending material to Yana, which was the, the newsletter that used to circulate, uh, around, and still does, I think, um, less regularly um, around the community of people uh, who do religious studies. And um, it's a reproduction below. It could be interesting um, uh, in case you can use it. Otherwise, could you please return it to me? And um, I guess I didn't. Um, anyway, I apologize for this um, to anyone in Elby's family. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, not finding the sentimental uh, letter, I, I see an unpaid uh, debt to him. Um, but uh, at any rate, that's where we are. So uh, what is religion? This is a term that is used in so many different ways for different purposes, positive and negative. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, and Richard and I had a great conversation. Um, Richard Egan, who's one of these wonderful people outside of religious studies, interested in religion and spirituality. Um, and I think, of, I think of these terms, I think of both terms as having to do with those aspects of how we are, how we come together, our traditions, our cultures, our, our biology, our brains. Um, they cultivate a sense of justice in people. 
Okay, this is what I think religion and spirituality really is. Um, so we tend to think of religion and spirituality as a kind of optional feature of, you know, you're, you have a belief of some kind or you don't, or you, you attend church or you don't. Um, but uh, more fundamental, I think th that's part of religion, of course. And when we look at the, the traditions that cultivate a sense of obligation and a sense of duty, we see obligations and duties to God or the gods. This is very much, in fact, it's, <laughs> that's one of the fundamental reasons we need to be focusing on the classical conception of religion, because obligations to the gods and to each other are so tightly knit together throughout the history of thought, the history of humanity, and I'll come back to that again. So I think religion and spirituality are useful terms. I don't think we should change like, the labels to, I don't know, legal studies or something like that. Justice has a much, much broader cultural meaning than, than we have a vocabulary yet to describe. And I think um, part of what Albie was interested in in the phenomenology of religion was in you know, coming to grips with the, the scope of that vocabulary. It's just much larger than, than rules and laws. So how do people have a sense of what we ought to do? What, how are we obliged to others and what are we owed? That's the, the area of thinking I want to get into. In the classical language, this was elaborated in, with respect to virtues and there was a, a much subtler vocabulary which we don't have ready to hand. And when we kind of reach for those terms, they, they, they don't have the meaning. I think justice does still have a, a, a reflect a kind of sensibility that most of us can, can um, intuit. That is, even people who do science and even people who are skeptics have a sense of what you ought to believe, what you ought to do in light of the evidence around you and so forth. That's what we get at in religious studies. So justice is cultivated in relation to a whole lot of things um, that are part of nature, um, b beliefs in gods the, and our ancestors, um, Sermons and public lectures, maybe even like this, will hopefully inspire a thought about justice if I'm lucky. Uh, our parents and exemplars around us are, we know in some way, or we think at least, have some connection to the, the sensibilities of what we owe others and what we are owed. Um, there are texts. There's, of course, the media, and some of this is alarming, those of you who know John's work, that people have ideas about others that uh, come from the media that tend to get distorted and can lead to, to appalling prejudices. And I'll get onto the topic of prejudice just a bit later. Um, concepts of unseen but felt powers, as we look across the Pacific, we see many such concepts. Concepts of man mana, um, concepts of taboo. Uh, in, in our own, um, in the so-called secular culture around us, we see concepts of justice, uh, concepts of liberty, concepts of constitutional law, obligation. These, these abstract concepts are part of the, the kind of material that, that, that scaffolds these sensibilities of what we owe people and what we're owed. They're rules of etiquette, and again, um, uh, some of John's work on this is, is absolutely impressive. These norms about, about how we should respect other people, whether we should wear a towel through town or not, for example. We have stories. Um, uh, we have explicit laws and conventions and um, all sorts of rituals, graduation, these sorts of things. All of this is part of what we, of how we relate to each other. And none of it is readily available in any single discipline, okay? But we know that these things are part of somehow of how we think about how we ought to relate to others. So there's just not a community, even a vicious community, that, uh, or a viscous <laughs> community that lacks a system for justice. Uh, uh, you know, uh, conceptions of morality and ethics can be corrupted, and we can think of uh, many examples from history and from our own society. Um, we know that culture, scholars are not outside of this kind of complex of having a sense of what is just and what we're owed. Uh, uh, now in psychology, there's a, a movement to you know, open science and um, uh, you know, um, pre-registering your hypotheses and making data available and all sorts of norms about, about what you owe others and, and what you can infer from, from what you learn. Um, we know that these are complex uh, uh, underpinnings of these sensibilities, that they're interconnected and variable and mostly tacit, but we don't know a whole lot about how that comes together. This hasn't, 
you know, there been, there's been some progress over the past 20 years, and I'm going to describe some studies uh, that I've been lucky to be a part of. Um, but most of that is really not clear, OK? Um, uh, we are just, um, in fact, we're not even at the stage of, of beginning to describe the kind of diversity and um, the patterns of, of human variation in these systems uh, that I think Albie was interested in when he was thinking about the phenomenology of religion as an, an important subject to teach. And that might have inspired you, you know, and others that, that, that took his courses. We're, we're, the, the kind of, um, we're, we're living in a society where these things are seen to be kind of marginal or um, um, optional, um, but, but they haven't ever been, and I, I doubt they are now. And I think that the, the result of this inattention to these systems has been uh, a loss of vocabulary and a loss of, of, of power and capacity to reconfigure these elements in ways that suit us in our, our time. I, I, I really think that. And of course, moving to Auckland and, and seeing the, the incredible changes that have taken place from you know, the kind of Nelson community um, uh, uh, orientation to, to the, the, a real serious commercialism is, is just reminding me of how fragile these systems are. Um, well, uh, when you look back at Albee's work, you know, he wrote a review uh, in 1975, so over 40 years ago, about religious studies in the Pacific. And if you can get that, a hold of that review, uh, I recommend having a look at it, because he describes a fascinating interdisciplinary environment uh, that is enriched by scholars from across the humanities and social sciences. Um, these are just some of the, the kind of terms that I, I picked out uh, from that. But throughout, Albi had a kind of uh, a real commitment to the scholarly study of religion as a place where, where there can be focus and integration um, in, these, um, in, in, in these studies. That, um, that uh, religious studies are um, uh, interpreting research broadly, references made to general research interests and teaching emphasis relating to religion of the staff of religious studies and other departments. This is important because such interests lead to specific research projects and serve as what he calls focal points for work done by advanced students subsequently. As you can, you need a kind of, I like that image of a focal point, that, a, you know, a kind of coordinating point where you can get disciplines such as, as diverse as sociology and, and history and, and legal studies and psychology coming together and attempting to develop a, a, more, a more integrated and a systematic understanding of what I take to be at least um, a, a fundamentally ethical systems. Um, and again, very mindful from the very beginning of the role of obligations and duties to traditions, to ancestors, and to the gods, and accepting of that kind of vocabulary as part of the human condition um, really um, is a, a, an incredibly compelling intellectual project that has, for a long time, attracted people, um, attracted Albie, and attracts many of you here. So where's the headroom now? Where, where are we, you know, what, what's changed since the 70s or, you know, since, since the past five to 10 years almost, uh, when I think about it, it's just dramatic expansion of resources that are going into the academic study of religion. From a global perspective, studying religion, uh, there's never been a better time to be studying religion. Um, uh, not only is there lots of funding going into this area, um, we're seeing the opening of uh, entirely new, new fields and new areas. A recent appointment of Russell Gray, who opened this lecture series, to, the, uh, to head the Max Planck Institute for the Science of, um, of Human History is just one example of a new move to become kind of, to, to integrate the study of religion with the natural and human sciences. Um, and, um, but there, there, there's yet to be these kind of focal point places. I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens at Max Planck, but having worked with, um, with, with groups of natural scientists, they're in a position that um, is somewhat behind, as you would expect. It's not through no fault of their own, but they're not where your first year students are, you know, if you're teaching in the Department of Religious Studies or Theology. They, their sensibilities are, um, have you, uh, their capacity and training for thinking about religion broadly in a way that, for example, Albie did, um, isn't 
isn't refined. And so that means that there's, and, and I'm gonna describe some of the studies I've done, there's some impressive results, but that are limited, and we can show why they're limited, because there's been a focus on you know, religion as one thing, not a complex of things. And there's a, a focus of religion as being about something um, you know, sort of optional. There's yet to be that kind of appreciation in, uh, of religion as an integrated set of systems um, that require the expertise of people from the humanities in order to, to flourish and thrive. And I think um, many of my humanities friends, and, and a wonderful exception of the open-minded people that have inherited Albie's legacy here, um, who have um, not had the training themselves in, in this area, but have had an openness to learning from it, while at the same time considering how they might contribute to it, that's a, a, a very rare position. Why is that rare? Is it because hum humanity scholars are, are um, out of touch or, or kind of backwards? No, it's rare because when you actually look at the work in the area, it's so monodimensional. It's, it's based on a kind of very limited understanding of religion. So when you look at it, you just, you know, kind of, it, 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 it appears to be um, um, uh, inconsistent with the kind of richness and variation that you understand and, and quite rightly needs to be corrected. Um, but that's where we are now. People kind of resisting this stuff is kind of obviously silly. Um, and um, uh, engaging with the kind of um, real power of these kind of methods to, to develop, I guess, incremental and very slow movement in understanding how, how history has come together to kind of enable systems for justice. Okay, so uh, that's the headroom. Um, I think it's pretty clear that if you think of religion and spirituality as just the starting point, we have a sense of obligation, attitudes to other. We don't really know where it comes from. These often, in fact, typically involve the gods, our responsibilities to God, to um, the gods, you know, to our ancestors. That needs to be allowed into the conversation. People who are engaging with that, that, those ideas need to be allowed into the conversation. People are educating. You know, ministers need to be included in these kind of conversations. Um, once we kind of accept that standpoint, we realize that there's just, um, uh, you know, a, a real importance to kind of developing that focal study of religion that Albie uh, uh, um, endorsed and promoted. Um, I do recommend on the concept of, I, I, I could have given a whole lecture on secularity and the kind of, um, problems I have with this concept um, as someone who doesn't fit into really any tradition very well, is unpopular with everyone, um, but um, lapsed Catholic is kind of like my category. Um, but I do really uh, think that this idea of the separation of secularity and religion is, is uh, uh, harmful potentially to those who are interested in justice and understanding it. And uh, Jeff Stout, my former advisor, had has a wonderful series of Gifford lectures on this. That, uh, hope to bring him out later in the year. Um, OK, so that's it. I wanted to get that stuff out because I think there, there, you know, there's several provocative and challenging ideas. There are the idea, you know, the idea that religious studies and theology need to be more tightly integrated, the idea that there's not enough humanities in science, um, the idea that religious studies really hasn't changed all that much in the past 40 years, except there are new opportunities with integrating natural sciences into the picture. I hope you, you challenge me on some of that stuff. I'm just going to describe a handful of studies I've been a part of. Uh, and if you want more information about them, let me know, um, because I can't go into any of them in too much detail. But I, all of them, in one way or another, get at the, the, the ideas and themes I've just raised. Justice, diversity, the impossibility of thinking about secularity and religion is neatly separated. Um, variation within religious groups, within secular groups, all of this we've been kind of documenting and studying for the past uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, so when you look at this image, what expression do you think? Someone who's 20 minutes into a lecture. <laughs> Is that how you feel? I forgot to do the rice you know, for my kids. Um, it's, um, this is a photo that we, uh, my colleague uh, in psychology at Victoria took uh, at a ritual. And it's a mother standing over her child. And her son is being pierced through the cheek with an object, um, which is puzzling. I mean, an anthropologist from Mars would find this puzzling at many different levels, uh, this idea that parents are meant to care for the kids. Why would you be 
harming your child, uh, you know, threatening the child, not just with pain, but with infection. It just doesn't seem part of any kind of natural order. Um, she's, that is obviously an expression of grief. In fact, she was screaming so loud that the, the boy was actually OK. I'm uh, stressed a little bit. But she was screaming so loud that the boy in the background has his hands cupped, right? He couldn't take the, the howling. That's um, an incredibly, I, I guess, you know, doesn't look to be the sort of thing you'd, you'd find in nature. But then, ah, this slide is entirely lost. Um, it's a slide just of this kind of human timeline. If we think about rituals, beliefs, and practices, if we focus on those elements of justice that I think are really important and neglected, beliefs and practices <laughs> respecting the gods, right? This, is, this has been part of the human condition since there have been humans. There's evidence. I'm glad that the Hurdos skulls turned up, because they are 150,000 years ago. So it's very hard to get your, wrap your head around 150,000 years of human history. But the way I do it is I, I sort of think of this step as antiquity. So my friends that were studying um, you know, religion in the classical world, if we think of that as you know, up to 2,000 years, or maybe take you out to 2,500, we get into the origins of Buddhism and um, you know, Hinduism and that. Well, we have to then walk that same distance of time, human existence, another 75 steps to kind of reach the first evidence of ritualistic behavior that we find in Midwash Ethiopia um, at, a, at a time depth of 150,000 years. You know, it's ritual engravings and what looks to be a child's skull, or what is a child's skull, and very deliberate etching. And um, Tim White and his colleagues interpret this as some kind of symbolic interaction, which would make sense. These are mod modern anatomical humans with linguistic capacities. Um, probably not. You know, different from us, culturally very different, but, but not so different that they would have imagining and um, as, uh, beliefs and practices that would be entirely inconsistent with those that we have or that we see around the world now. Yet um, engaging with what they take to be divine, right, which unseen powers, and um, that's all conserved. That's all maintained. That could be dropped right, at any point. But people retain these features of culture, these cultural. This actual, that tradition that I showed there, that's, actually, that's an interesting case of people borrowing from one Hindu community, um, a Tamil Hindu community, to a non-Tamil community, some of the elements. Um, but, um, but the fact that there were these rituals, these practices, these texts, forms, elements, those are very old. Your phone is obsolete instantly, almost. Um, and yet, we retain these very puzzling features as part of how we relate to each other. Okay. So there have been theories about uh, the so-called big gods hypothesis, um, uh, really formulated in the 60s, and then again reinvented. And the things that scientists kind of do is just forget that other people have had, the <laughs> had those ideas, because like they, they don't read anything. right? They just cite the article. Maybe you look at the abstract, forget it instantly. But the idea of um, beliefs in moralizing gods goes back to the, you know, Critias and the, the Greeks expresses a, a wonderful cultural evolutionary theory about gods as policing human society. The Mosi is a wonderful document in, um, in the Chinese tradition expressing nearly the identical view, nearly in the same words. Um, but uh, the theory reappears that there are these big moralizing gods. And when those, are, uh, those ideas, those beliefs kind of hold societies together because they cause people to restrain their selfishness. There looks to be these kind of correlations. Um, and it's connected with water scarcity. You see more of these beliefs, um, ecological stress. We've been part of some of that work using global databases to see these kind of relationships between moralizing religions and uh, environmental stressors. Um, we have the, um, in addition to large societies, um, uh, uh, ideas about um, um, uh, norm compliance as being very fundamental. So people who have these kind of concepts uh, don't tend to believe you should break the laws, that kind of stuff. Um, but it could be that th those features are just kind of retained with culture. And we don't know whether it's the belief in gods that's doing driving that, because of course, the cultures that have this have so much else. In the case of the major traditions, Christianity and Islam, we have active proselytization, universal religion, exhortations to be fertile that can lead to the expansion of a religion. 
Um, it might be the singular God idea, not the moralizing God, the kind of focal God idea that's kind of uh, driving these kind of capacities to interact among strangers. Uh, there might be purely secular features, like the invention of a, polit a political system that get, then carries these beliefs along with it. It just isn't clear at all that that is good evidence. Um, you will have heard from Rush, uh, Russell some, some work that we did looking at the, the time ordering of these beliefs. So one way you can kind of get it, a, an idea of do these beliefs actually drive larger societies is using Pacific religious diversity, where you have big cultures and small cultures, and you have cultures with different religious beliefs. And through methods that um, Russell described in the first lecture, but they're from computational biology, you can kind of infer patterns of change in those two things. Does society come, become complex before or after big gods? If it comes, becomes, tends to become complex after the emergence of big gods, then we can think that maybe big gods have a role. And what we find when we test this, and we, built, we spent three years building this kind of database, most of these people are in psychology or computer science. That person's in environmental science. It doesn't deal with humans at all. Um, these people ended up being historians, like really getting into the historical record and, and, and reading all of the original ethnographic works. And I don't know what Russell is. <laughs> but um, we, um, we, we find that, um, no, there isn't this kind of like big god idea. There isn't, you know, big gods don't tend to anticipate big societies. In fact, we don't find big gods of the kind that we find in, in European and Asian uh, and in um, East Asian cultures uh, in the Pacific, what we find are a bunch of gods, and um, and where we find those gods having kind of moralizing beliefs, we find that those gods tend to be um, anticipating the emergence of larger societies. Yes, yeah, so gods that have moral interests tend to be preceding the rise of political complexity, but they don't keep. They're not sufficient. It's not like there's one feature that keeps. You know, societies together. Uh, Russell talked about the role of humans. What other features then besides the belief feature might be part of the kind of um, the mechanisms or the systems or the, um, the diversity of life, of cultural life that gives rise and supports and scaffolds large societies. We find that human sacrifice was part of the story of this move to social inequality, that where you have ritual human sacrifice, this tends to consolidate the power of elites. And that that's part, you know, it's a transient period. It doesn't seem to last in any culture, but it's there almost in every culture where elites consolidate the power. They, I don't know, do they fire people <laughs> who have permanent jobs? Um, that sometimes happens at universities as well. Um, it might have happened here. Anyway, um, uh, so we find that, that these blood rituals are part of that system of oddly justice. Like, it's, again, it's not the intuitive kind of law, Harvard Law School 101, you're going to get a course on, on um, social in, the evolution of inequality and blood sacrifice. Um, some of the work that we were doing in, um, in the labs I've been contributing uh, to have looked at just body movements. So what we find in, what we found in the psychological literature is that people tended to, who tend to orient themselves and align themselves together tend to have greater camaraderie, and you can actually independently manipulate that. So yeah, we tend to align when we are feeling connected, but actually aligning with others can make them feel more connected. It operates tacitly in outside awareness. Um, so Paul Reddish, a New Zealander who uh, came to Victoria to study um, with us, uh, began to kind of really try to strip this down. Let's get people who aren't looking at each other, but kind of aware that they're moving together. And, and do we see these effects of synchrony and body movement uh, with cooperation. I'll just show this because it just tells you of how we've lost sound, but Oops. very carefully controlled stuff. Will doing that together, uh, ask a question, do you think that doing that's going to make you more cooperative than if you're doing that but out of alignment? Or would that tend to make you? Should we do it all together? <laughs> this lecture will get, this talk will get so much better if we do that. Um, I don't know. Um, we do find these, like, Paul was wonderful. He, he himself, this is a whole personal story, but Paul was working in government, and he, done, he done, did psych and did stats, and he hated having to give government the answer that they wanted all the time. So, like, he really wanted to get into research to, to get at the 
Yeah. To get at questions in a kind of pure way. And what he discovered is that psychologists are very keen on just publishing the result. And what we see here is that, yeah, there is this kind of trend. So that, yeah, if, I mean, if we act in, in, in controlled ways in synchrony, we do see that there's more willingness to donate time to others. That's the kind of um, uh, dependent variable. That's the thing that we're, we're measuring after randomly assigning people to these groups. Um, but he wasn't satisfied that that was like a really big or reliable effect. And when you start running more people, the effect would tend to just, just vanish. And um, so um, in thinking about it, in thinking about natural, you know, what are, we don't ever strip down to this kind of just moving like this. This isn't part of any culture, even in a context of, say, military marching, where people are, are marching in sync. And that does seem to be a feature of military training. It's with regard to specific goals. We're part of a unit. We know we're part of a unit. We have concepts of a tradition. We have ideals. Um, we have real purposes for being together, life and death purposes for cooperating with each other. All of that's part of what you're <laughs> understanding as you're moving. So he wanted to vary the, the group goals with the individualistic goals in a, in a controlled way, just having people do exactly the same motions, but telling them either we're, we're seeing how well you cooperate with others in being in sync. So that was one condition. And the other condition was we're seeing how much better you are than others in timing you know, to a metronome. And um, very just small adjustment, exactly the same conditions. And what we found in, um, by measuring willingness to take a risk in betting that others will cooperate with you, we give you $7 no matter what. Um, but if everyone in your group cooperates with you, we give you 10. If one kind of defects and takes the $7 option, um, that person gets the $7 option, but the rest of you get nothing, OK? So in this kind of condition, we all have an interest in being together and aligning and cooperating and being a team. But do you predict that others are going to cooperate? And if you predict that you know, one person might not, you're not actually, you're being rational. That person's going to defect. If I defect, if everyone defects, well, at least we get seven. Um, we had to play around with that number a bit. And what Paul found um, in this study was that there was just substantially more giving. You know, that decision to commit, that binary decision was substantially higher in the synchrony goal condition. Um, but we didn't find it elsewhere. We just found a, 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 real, a real cooperative boost from working together and then having that goal, which uh, for me was just like, a wonderful learning experience from this, this PhD student. Just be patient, think about it. You know, don't lose your mind to some kind of, you know, uh, th th there's an entire cottage industry in synchrony right now, um, and um, which has lost touch of the kind of human ecologies where this occurs. We actually did some work in natural human ecologies, looking at groups that vary in synchrony and in um, their kind of goal structures. Now, at that time, I was a competitive runner. I was really impressed by how connected my club was. And I thought that the club was going to be highly cooperative in these kinds of um, uh, um, conditions. If we measure people after a race, we're all going to be giving to each other and trusting each other. We also had these measures of how closely we feel connected to each other. And I thought they're going to be much more closely connected. No, we didn't find this. But what we found was that um, these are just the absolute uh, giving amounts. But we found that the, the student church group and the, the chanting group and the yoga group and the, the curtain ch chanting, the choir, they, you know, the running was last. It was behind poker, right? which kind of makes sense. You are competing with the other person. It's an individualistic goal right? in, in that particular um, race condition. Um, and that the, the kind of goal structures that are part of those communities, you know, that connectedness that you get from sharing not just a goal, or, but, but having a sacred goal, is, is driving a kind of cooperativeness. That, and we can measure this. It's kind of the interesting thing about this approach in the study of religion. We can actually determine what the magnitudes of difference are. And, and um, I, I won't describe that path model. But we can see that when we model it, it's because when people are acting together with a common goal, they tend to anticipate and trust each other. They just can predict each other much more accurately. And that, that, that part of having a kind of um, a sacred belief system is fundamental to maintaining that um, level of predictability in people. Now, that's not a controlled experiment. We can't just select and randomly assign people to their religions or their athletic activities. Um, so we can only get the inference that we can get. But we can see how this 
might work, and that then leads to other studies. Again, mindful that we're not getting anywhere near a kind of, uh, it, p p the idea of a complete understanding of how that comes together in humans is, is, is probably elusive. Um, but we're getting something still. It's not everything, but it's something. We can see that that's important, at least in those communities. And we can expect that it could be important in others. Oh, I have this whole thing on the Reformation, which I was very tempted to. <laughs> I'm going to describe it. Because um, it's just so, uh, uh, again, showing the kind of complicated relationship between religious traditions and, um, and, and, and the pattern of, of, of human history that gave rise to this university, this town, the, the kind of Protestant ideals that, that emerged after the Reformation. Um, again, we have this pattern of religious diversity, and many religious studies scholars will just stop there and describe it or comment on it. Well, is that pattern random? <laughs> like, what's, what's, what's underlying that pattern? Why do we see like, you know, cosmetic industry spirituality arise? You know? And how is that connected to blood sacrifice in the Aztec period? And how is that related to these institutions that have been around for so long? Um, and how is that related to kind of foraging societies that, that have healing rituals? We don't really understand that pattern at all. We, again, we haven't even begun to describe it. But people who look at the biological world have a similar problem. I'm, the non-human biological world, we have these birds. You know, they look all different. We could spend our lifetime describing those differences. But when you, try, when you model the pattern of variation underlying it, you can see that there is, there's a clear something happened. There was the, you know, opportunities that arose that gave rise to these kind of speciation events. This is the kind of tree that describes um, the eastern wood warblers. Um, and you can see that early, about five million years ago, a bunch of opportunities presented, and it led to diversification uh, in the species, which they then conserved and inhabited. And, and that gives, that's you know, part of this story of var variation. That's an, kind of an incredible thing that we can do. We can also do this with churches. You know, like we have a kind of relationship, a historical relationship in Christendom, which is, is fairly well-timed. Um, where we can show the kind of breaks that give rise to uh, denominations. So what is, you know, in the first instance, let's just see what that pattern is. And, you know, it, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that we recover, you know, we see actually suppression of variation for a very long period of time, and then an eruption, just complete, you know, emergence of, 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 of a constantly kind of fragmenting um, what we find is, in addition to the Protestant Reformation, about 250 years ago, we see this other burst of change that's much smaller. Um, and this can, again, invite historians into seeing what's the actual magnitude of these changes across Christianity um, after the Reformation occurred. It can kind of draw you in. Um, but, you know, it can kind of also address deeper uh, puzzles about functionality. So what we, we're looking at, these trees are different, and this is what, why I was kind of not, I'm a bit worried about this particular study, because these trees are just showing that amount of length is no longer time. It's the amount of change within a tradition after breaking. So we, have to, we can kind of infer how, after, you know, when, when there is a denominational split or schism, how much does a denomination change at that point, and how much does it change after? And it turns out that you you really can't observe historically every change in a system. You have to, in part, infer the rates of change across a system over time. Anyone who's worked with historical data will kind of know that you, you can only get so much understanding of specific rules and changes. And you know, some, sometimes this is written down. M many times it isn't. I have a friend who works with bacterial lineages, and they independently kind of came up with these same methods, even though they can video the bacteria <laughs> under a microscope because you just can't observe everything, even in a system that you control. Um, and what we see is um, across this kind of pattern of you know, how much is changing after a break, uh, a really clear relationship between breaking and change in beliefs. So this, about 53% of the changes that take place within denominations occur at the point when they're splitting from others, you know, either just before or just after. And that suggests that. Um, you can imagine, like with the, with, with, with the Reformation, this was 100 years of bloody you know, warfare and so forth, and you have real practical consequences. People committed to beliefs and practices that are changing in ways that are consistent with a model that at least part of that is reflecting a kind of um, 
desire to be distinct from others. You're differentiating, you're marking a boundary, and you're understanding who it is that you can cooperate with and predicting who, who it is that you might want to um, mistrust. This is called schismogenesis in the biological literatures. And um, yeah, there's kind of evidence for schismogenesis in the Reformation. I don't think this would surprise any historian. What Russell kind of noticed when we looked at the graphs, and we're working on this now, is one branch looks to be changing a lot more than another. I, I thought that was incredibly ingenious. Like, it looks like it's not just that there's a 53% change and everyone's changing. It looks like there's an anchor point within a tradition and then a burst in the other. So, and, and so the, again, when we kind of even just looking at the graphs, it draws us into figuring out, well, maybe there's a kind of process there where some, the church becomes more conservative, the others become much more changing as a way of rapidly um, adapting to a situation. Um, I, we could do this probably with scientific communities as well. So again, it's not just to pick on, you know, it's not to say, <laughs> it's, uh, any, any system that is involved with a set of ideals and beliefs, you know, will potentially be prone to this kind of thing, academic departments. Um, OK, just two more studies. Uh, uh, this is just a study on ritual. And um, we compared rituals that had a very high uh, intensity uh, pain element with rituals uh, that were um, low in intensity within the same community, within the same ritual, um, Thai Pusam, um, uh, about a 10-day celebration, really a month long of people preparing in, in Mauritius for um, a, a, a sacred uh, a event that brings the community together. Will people be differently affected by the kind of music and scriptural readings and the kind of um, low arousal rituals, for lack of a better word, than they are to the kind of high arousal, blood piercing kind of rituals? So when we look at the, the low arousal rituals, they're really lovely community settings. People, again, are hanging out and giving each other food and. Um, um, having, um, um, it's, it's the same solemn experiences that uh, I think uh, people at church uh, in New Zealand would experience, these folk are experiencing around this time. Um, that's uh, Ron, my colleague. Oh, my Paul was not fed well, so I, I thought I should get that in there, because he was not having a low arousal time. He was constantly starving, because we didn't really provide enough food, but um, the temple did. Um, and he was a good sport. Um, I didn't have enough food either, but I didn't get that hungry. Um, and then the extreme rituals are people carrying massive carts around with, uh, they had to restrict the diameter of the, of the pole piercing going through their backs because it was getting, elaborating a kind of um, a competitiveness among these uh, ritual um, uh, participants. Um, age, you know, people who are older uh, were involved in this, or middle-aged. Um, uh, uh, these are kind of some of the piercings. I, I don't know if I, I might have taken, yeah, I think I took it out for simplicity, but they're, they're, this isn't just like a fraternity ritual. People are, again, mothers are hanging out with the children while this is happening, and you think, oh, this is just strange. But it wasn't, um, uh, I think the sensibilities of the sacred would be part of that experience. And I think Albie would have loved this stuff. He would have really been fascinated to understand what's happening at the level of the phenomena. At the level of the behavior, we see that in the low arousal ritual, people are still giving a lot. This is almost 100 Mauritian rupees, and so they're giving, on average, what was it, like 80, 80 rupees. But in the high ordeal ritual, they were giving um, you know, uh, uh, near, twice that, um, at least in the observers. The participants were potentially giving less, and we don't know whether it's because they were just poor or because they felt like, hey, I've car carried this cart around. I'm not going to give money back to the temple. And we were able to configure the experiment in such a way that, uh, that these were anonymous and that they, um, that they didn't um, know that we were tracking them. Um, and we could see that the more people tended to give more when they perceived more pain in the ritual. There was this kind of relationship. That was the nice, tidy graph that we published. In real life, underneath that is huge heterogeneity. Some people are perceiving a lot of pain and not giving much. That's what this is kind of showing. Others are giving a lot. There's, you know, under every model, there's a lot of this diversity. In them. But the pattern is nevertheless evident. Why pain? Again, in light of our work, we were thinking the idea that the goal structures are there. It's not just that you're doing pain. It's not like someone's putting a pole through you. It's, it's in the context of giving and receiving and real rehearsed charity uh, throughout the ritual. And giving to the gods, nourishing the gods, you know, respecting the gods and as sources of our existence and continuance in life. Um, 
that's a fundamental part of what's happening here. It's not just people sticking poles. You know, there's a whole complex of, of aspects to these rituals that make them uh, worth people conserving, um, both subjectively and I, the functional benefits are very clear. And in these rituals, what we see is an extension of identity. In a context where the community doesn't have clear boundaries, um, people tend to identify even across the religious lines. So we didn't predict this. We've, we, we, we had people sort of pick an identity. Are you Mauritian or are you Hindu? And after these rituals, um, uh, the high perf uh, arousal rituals, people were not saying, I'm, I'm more um, Hindu. I, what they're saying is, I'm more Mauritius. Because in this particular context, being Mauritian is that kind of concept of unity. We're all connected. And I, su I suspect that many of the, the Christians 500 years after the Reformation, uh, at least in the communities I've interacted with, it's more like, yeah, OK, this is, they, they, there's much more sense of connection here than you would have probably felt in the, you know, in the 19th century or even the 20th century. The, um, it's the kind of broader concepts are, are relating to the practices in ways that define the response, the behavior. Here, more identity, more connection, um, more willingness to give to people who are identifying with that, that larger group. OK, just a few from the NZABS value study. These are really short. We have this ongoing uh, longitudinal study. Is anyone in the New Zealand Attitudes and Value Study? We um, sampled um, about 1%, I think 1% or 2% of the population. We're going to sample 7% uh, by next year. Um, and it's just um, an ongoing longitudinal study in this great place of longitudinal studies where we're following people around and trying to figure out um, how do attitudes and values and beliefs change, and, how they, and what remains stable, and how does that affect um, employment? How does that affect uh, political opinions? How does it affect uh, um, medical health, um, um, hospitalization, disease, and ultimately mortality? Um, and to get at those questions requires um, questions about um, at, you know, social psychological questions and behavioral questions. Um, the, uh, the study uh, from a random sample, which is almost, I don't, it might be unique to New Zealand, or at least it's rare that we can obtain a, the electoral roll from government, which means that we can randomly sample. Everyone who's been in the country for more than 10 months or nine months has to be on the electoral roll, and we can randomly sample from that roll, um, which yields a very accurate kind of cross-section of New Zealanders. Uh, we undersample Asians um, in part because of language, we think, in, in part because of culture. We oversample Maori a bit, and we're pr pretty bang on with Pacific, um, oversampling women, which is consistent with much. And of course, um, as we get responses, different things are happening. We have the church, Christchurch earthquake before and after. We can see how that affects beliefs and attitudes and health. Um, we, um, we have the rugby cup. This led to an, an, a, a big inflation of happiness. Uh, Perceptible inflation of happiness reporting. We can't do anything about that. But um, we, we see it go up and then drop. <laughs> um, uh, um, we have um, the Marriage Equality Act. Um, we have the NZ elections, which we predicted. We have the paper uh, on which we ret retrospectively predicted the elections. And that's any single day of the NZ ABS. That's how many people, you know, it just kind of, in these histograms, you get these piles of people. And as John knows, you have to enter all that information. Um, that was the political result. Um, we also have these, this list of questions about religion, and we're going to expand some of those questions uh, in, in this next project. I'd be really interested in knowing what you think we should be asking about what underpins a, a sense of virtue. Um, and um, we'll be um, uh, you know, trying to attempt to see how it is that, that people become more Forgiving, you know, more generous. I'll talk about those studies in, in a moment. Um, on the on the volunteering side of things, we can just do a, a quick comparison of religious people and non, you know, people who affiliate with religion and don't. And we see that there are these big differences in mean hours of time per week. How many hours do you volunteer per week? Um, if you belong to a religious community, um, you know, it's uh, almost twice as much. Um, and we look at the level of religious identification, we can see it's, it's driven really by the highly religiously identified people. It's something, you know, John, who's worked with this data quite a bit, will know that these low levels of religious identification don't really carve people at, at, at a clear behavioral joint. You don't have more, many more kids if you're low in religious identification but affiliated. 
if you're very high, that's where we begin to see almost, almost like species-like differences in, in, in volunteering in, in number of children. I encourage you to follow John's uh, uh, ongoing work in this area because it is quite fascinating on families and um, religious affiliation. Uh, looking at the proportion of zeros, more, more people donate at least some time in the highly identified religious. And when we look at the amount of giving, you see even adjusting after we adjust for levels of income, we don't find the big income differences in New Zealand between re religiously affiliated and non-affiliated people like you would in the United States. We see up to five times, or, you know, over, well over five times the amount of giving in the very highly religiously identified group. That's like a massive you know, economy. And I think part of what we want to do is actually try to measure that magnitude, which is very important. People aren't, if you, if you go into this idea that, oh, religion is optional, or it's just this like, thing that's out there, and it's not really relevant, and you see that there's like this hidden economy, that's very important to, to actually study and invest. Is it efficient? So in the, you know, North, people tend to think, oh, well, they're giving to churches, and then they discount it. But churches can be very efficient. Some of the most, um, to my mind, maybe appalling politically um, churches, you know, the ones that are less interested in liberty and that, you know, because whatever, I'm, those are my <laughs> beliefs about justice and what you owe people, can be very effective charities. So we have to kind of keep that in, in mind as we investigate where, how that money is used. Why? Because they're relying on volunteers and... So anyway, um, we can see the conversion of the, as my colleague Jeff Troughton points out, there's a whole literature in this, conversion of the wallet and conversion. Religious converts don't tend to give as much initially as religious people. There isn't really a, di a difference when people start become religious. It can take time to develop, cultivate that pattern of charity. Um, so uh, conversion is something, and deconversion is what we can look. What's the magnitude of loss when someone disaffiliates from religion in terms of the amount of money going into charity? We can begin to look at that because of the, the folk who, stopped, who started that, you know, Chris Sibley and, and, and the people of the NZABS. Getting to my final um, uh, result, but, uh, just on belief in God. So this is important. Levels of religious identification here. Highly religiously identified people Almost all of them believe in God. About 2% don't. That might be measurement error. Maybe some people are really identified but don't believe in a God. 25% of people who have no religious affiliation still believe in a God. So this is, a, again, a sizable portion of a, a pretty representative sample. of. Um, so you know, if you're walking around the, the universities, this is not the kind of world that's out there. <laughs> OK. And then when we break it down over time, I just kind of put these plots together. We can see that there's, there's you know, a, a fair stability in this pattern. There might be a little bit of dropping in um, belief in God over time. But you, know, you, have, you need long periods of time to really track this at a national level. Um, and, uh, but when we ask people whether they believe in a spirit or a life force, on average, we're getting you know, 60, 70, up, you know, percent of 60, over 60% of people, sorry. Yeah, and this graph, I think in the other graphs it was over 60, it's just slightly under, oh no, that's above 60 because it's 75. Percent of people who don't affiliate with any religion uh, saying that they believe in a spirit or life force, saying that they believe in supernatural. That's really high, and we, of course it doesn't go up to the top because highly identified religious people see that as superstition, as heresy in that. So <laughs> they're not gonna be committing to that idea. Um, but that's like, that will win every election. That will, again, that's a, a very large percentage of that population out there. If you're thinking about the courses you're teaching, I don't know how you would tap into that, but that is a very big um, number of people. And if we look at that over time, we see the people who are highly identified are more likely to believe in a spirit or life force, which is kind of interesting. There might be a slight dropping in that among the non-identified people, which we are tracking. So that was the, the last finding. The, uh, the very last finding is just within religion heterogeneity. People tend to think, oh, well, there's just like you're religious or you're not. When we look at the, va the patterns of value within religious groups, we can see that there's uh, an incredible kind of separation that, um, between disaffected people. How do you think about your religion? You know, why are you involved? Are you in it for something else? Are you in it because it's intrinsically right, because you have a kind of group goal? These are all kind of dimensions of being interested in religion. And we can use methods from biomedical science to extract kind of patterns and profiles of people, types of people that are out there within these denominations. Some are very extrinsic. Um, they, they think of religion as just a, a means to socializing and meeting other people. 
Um, they're not really into fundamentalism. Others are quest-oriented. They're not at all into fundamentalism, but they're very much into religion as a kind of a road to follow in its own right. Um, we break it down by denomination. This is, becomes very interesting because you see that about 33% of Anglicans are disaffected, 37 are questy, moderatic, moderates, fundamentalists, very low number of fundamentalists in the Anglicans, right? We compare them to the Christian no faith declared or the Christian others, and we see, you know, the profile jumps up to all, you know, 36% um, of that group, the kind of the charismatic, whoa, whoa, sorry, groups are going to be more um, fundamentalist. We can look at the quest breakdowns, and again, we see, you know, sort of patterns of, of difference and similarity across the denominations. The Anglican quest person, who, you know, about 37% is going to be very similar in their orientation to religion as the Catholic quest person, a kind of, you know, interesting thought when you think about the denominational differences and the markers there are not really capturing the kind of underlying patterns of variation within these communities. Like the, the dom denominational marker is a bad marker of the kind of patterns of value that, that exist within those communities. It's just not cutting anything at a joint. It might be cutting something, though, right? Because the Christian others really are, if you look at the breakdowns, you know, the categories are different. The lumps are different. So you will get a kind of presentation in the groups of something that looks different to the, to the others. But it's not, um, it can be very, very misleading just to think of Catholics and Anglicans, Presbyterians as being one thing. And you know, as we pour into that, what explains that pattern of variation in there? You know, what history gave rise to it? Where is it going? You know, how does that? pattern affect things like charity and health. And those are the kind of questions that you know, remain ahead of us, of all of us, really. And anyone who wants to get involved with this, please do, because we need help. Um, where's religion headed in our own society? I think this is a, uh, probably the most important result, is that we see a pattern of decline, and churches are feeling it, of people dropping out of affiliation. What about individuals? It became apparent. I didn't ever think of this. I was one of those people who thought secularization is just because people are dropping out of religion. But in any society, we have two things going on at the same, three things. People are either remaining the same, affiliated or not. That's one thing, let's call it that. Uh, and then we, they're either becoming religiously affiliated or they're disaffiliating, right? And it's that kind of, the sum of those, those processes yield the society-wide effect, ignoring migration. So if you're having more disaffiliation than you're having affiliation, you'll get a kind of net trend to disaffiliation, right? But we know that underlying that, some people are affiliating during that time period. What's explaining the affiliation? What's explaining the disaffiliation? We break it out. You can only do that if you measure the same people over time, if you know who's disaffiliating and affiliating. Surveys like the census can't get at that. Um, and we could see if after the Christchurch earthquake, there was a kind of conversion. But the conversion took place because the ratio of those two processes shifted. There was just much more conversion than there was deconversion. But there was still deconversion, OK? Um, and what we find is that deconversion is very, I mean, it's still, prob the probability is low. The, you know, it's, people are not you know, disaffiliating you know, all that much. But over time, it, they are. There, there's more disaffiliation, um, just under half of 1% each year among people. But that's dropping over the, life of the uh, lifespan. So if you were aging and religious, the probability of you becoming disaffiliated I'll use religion in that term, affiliated or not, is dropping. And if you were not religiously affiliated, the probability of becoming religiously affiliated over time is increasing, right? And it's the same time. It's the same time window that, that, that society is becoming secular. Society as a whole is becoming secular because of that area under the curve. You need that area, you subtract out that area, and that gives you the net population change for everyone over the age of 20. It's big. It's, there's just much more deconversion among young people. But that's dropping as they age. And as people get older, and, and, you know, Richard and I were talking about the kind of things that might be driving people to religion as they age. And we can have conversations about that. But we, we need to be mindful that the kind of secular, secularization trend isn't happening universally and uniformly. And age is a big factor. That's all correct, but it involves two processes. OK, that's it for the NZAVS. Um, Albie, I encourage you to look at the end of, the, um, of, of that wonderful paper uh, where he encourages the study of churches and church change from within 
religious studies and encourages the expansion of the study of the phenomenology of religion. That's been happening a bit in the sciences and some of the work that I've been uh, describing today. I think a lot of it still remains ahead of us. And uh, I think you'd be very happy with some of the scientific community and philosophers in this group who are, have published on the kind of science of religion um, as uh, you know, kind of potential or as actual and active members of our uh, wider uh, religious uh, studies community. Um, these are some of the people who've helped with funding. And of course, Chris, my colleague, uh, uh, endlessly hardworking fella with the questionnaires. Uh, and that's the end. So thank you. I'm sorry, I just went on 15 for the hour. Uh, if people have questions, I can bring the microphone around. Um, I'm happy to take questions after, too. Uh, and if anyone needs to take off and get some dinner, you won't offend me. I've seen much worse. <laughs> Um, so one thing I've recently observed is uh, a shift um, away from Western um, spirituality towards more Eastern solutions, um, such as Eastern medicines, shamans, um, other individuals that provide spiritual outlets um, and cultural mm. values. Um, for example, ayahuasca in Peru or um, peyote and that sort of thing. So I was wondering, uh, in terms of the religious studies, is that a, a, a point of um, interest in terms of understanding uh, spiritual um, enlightenment uh, and through uh, substance-mediated um, experiences? So these substances can generate these sort of temporal understandings which bring you to a certain place and a certain feeling, yep. um, which some religions do. Um, so I was just wondering if you could comment on substance-mediated um, spirituality. Yes. Um, so um, a couple of things to point out. And again, with respect to the person who you know came up with the, whose work and life inspired this series, um, a real interest in types of religious experience and their outward expressions, not only in churches but in forms of folk and civ civil religion. Um, and these kind of communities are um, places where people engage in all sorts of um, practices and have ideas uh, and debates also about how those practices cultivate um, transformation in people and in social groups and why that transformation is important. It's inherently kind of normative stuff. And um, the, um, there are many people who are studying these Air, on, on the, on the, in the medical sciences, there's more interest in psychedelics and microdosing, but that's very difficult because of the laws and the ethics around this. So, um, but there have long been people who are really interested in, I think we had one of these people in my department, he hired every book it, it, you, know, you could possibly imagine on, that, on these sorts of topics it, it are part of our library system in New Zealand or at Victoria. Um, uh, we've taught courses on this. Yes, so I think that, that those are fundamental and very interesting aspects of the human condition. What do they do for people? What, what are the practical effects? You know, how, how different are those effects from, say, secular um, interests that people have, like just music? Or do, wh how do the spiritual ideals, do they matter within those communities? Like, for example, if you're engaging in a practice where you're taking a psychedelic um, uh, agent, but you have a, a certain purpose and belief, is the effect on you going to be different? Is it going to transform you in different ways? There have been some studies on this that um, have looked at people who've had those um, exposures in the context of a, a, a Christian celebration, Good Friday, and, and have lifelong effects, right? Transformation, even after they're aware that there was an experiment involved. So these are very interesting and compelling questions. They might have practical you know, applications. And um, I, you know, I, 
I think that, that the key point I'd like to make in this lecture is that um, these need to be more directly linked with ideas about ethics than they are. We don't really teach ethics at the university. And, they're in, and, and the way in which they're taught, and it's, it's a, you know, there's studies out there that exhibit appalling prejudice against religious folk who if you, um, if you if a global study underway now, but some North American study looking at um, attitudes to people who have a kind of t traditional faith, right? The not, the not so cool faith that their parents had. If we look at the history of Buddhism, it's, yeah, you could find, it doesn't look like new age spirituality. Those people um, tend to think that you can't be a scientist if you have that commitment, right? But science is like dentistry. It's like so laser-like and narrow. We, you know, you're never answering questions like big questions about how it all started and that. Like we, we're, you know, we're, we're just dealing with these inferences and getting all sorts of error and variance. You know, it's just like not part of what science is. So um, those kind of mis misconceptions and prejudices are very commonplace, and it'd be nice to begin to correct them. Um, another place, there are also pre prejudices against atheists, by atheists, too, on the other end. So you, you want to look at that, that people think that atheists can't be ethical, and that, you know, that they're more likely to be doing extremely um, unethical things. That's not, we, I was part of that study, and we didn't find that in New Zealand, which was a source of great, you know, kind of comfort. John's done some work on attitudes towards Muslims. This is an, a really important issue for this country, because people have appalling prejudices against Muslims, which are unfounded. They're based on like media exposure. You know, the Muslims around here are just like trying to get their kids to school and they have their belief. And, and they're actually explicitly teaching concepts of virtue in relationships and obligations to God is they, after their own fashion. Um, and you know, an attack happens and they just get pummeled. You know? <laughs> what does that do to a society over time when you're pummeling and not giving a certain class you know, opportunities? It's not healthy. Um, and yeah, so the, these are the kinds of issues we face. And I would you know, very much like to see you know, those sorts of um, factors of human religious phenomena integrated with um, um, the study of, of yeah, ethics, I guess. As I understood it, at the very beginning of your presentation, you rolled religion and spirituality mm together, yes. but commonly in New Zealand conversation, people go out of their way to separate the two yep. and to say, oh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Yep. And I'm wondering if you'd like to comment on this um, attempt that people make to, um, to separate the two. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, I mean, even with the spiritual questions, those are belief type questions, and we see this pattern that's commonplace. Um, so why did, first, why do I group spirituality with religion? Um, and why, in a moment, and why do many of my studies then disentangle those two elements and then begin to break it down? Well, in the first instance, rhetorically, I think it's very important for people to not draw a line of difference around themselves and the folk that have you know, traditional religious beliefs. Their beliefs are kind of like that, <laughs> a life force or a spirit, not so different. So um, why did those, why did those dif differences become salient? Why do people then tend to think this marks a huge difference in, in, in orientation? How did that happen? I, I don't really know. You know and and what, are the, what are the effects there? So we do find that, that some beliefs and commitments, say the sacred goals, you know, really being connected to community. And again, this is not a result I particularly wanted because I you know, was really wanting my running community. I thought that they were getting some, at some of these kind of aspects of um, connection that you get in churches. But they're not, right? So absent that kind of language and vocabulary of the sacred and the reverent, they're not accessing these things. Are people accessing the same kinds of... Um, are they changed and altered and transformed to get back to these ideas in the same way if they belong to a, a specific community? A, you know, does a specific community size matter? Does it, do specific beliefs matter? You know, these are questions we, we, we can't know in advance, right? So in the first instance, I think it's really important not to draw too sharp a distinction around religious people and then everyone else. Um, this, and then within that, um, we then want to look at the patterns of variation that arise from within those groups as well. And this is something, of course, you know, Jeff's lecture, um, the Gifford lecture just wonderfully describes debates that 
would see secular and religious people, political debates, you know, so, uh, slavery is a huge topic. If you think of anything as, you know, evoking of despair now, think about human chattel slavery and the people that resisted it. And that from within religious communities and for religious reasons, they saw their communities as unethical, right? Their religious communities are coming up with support for practices that are seeing people traded as property. That actually went away, but it, you know, or it still exists, but, but the, at least the North Atlantic trade went away because there were people who were religious and secular fighting people who were religious and secular. It didn't carve a joint between the social movements. Um, so that's why I break down religion and spirituality in that way. And, and because you know, as you know, we get talking about these things, why are people interested in public health to begin with? You know, why, isn't it, why isn't the foundational question yeah, we, we believe it's important. We, we have a set of obligations to a community. Where does that belief come from? How is it support? What's the underpinning of it? Where is it going? Um, and I, I've yet to come across people you know, in the science who are utterly committed to, to, to changing the world, changing science. Um, I, I think that's the kind of primitive thing I want to start with. And then, yeah, people are going to have different beliefs. And um, we need to you know, have a conversation about what those beliefs are, allow people to express themselves after their own fashion. And in the... You know, importantly, if you're going to change someone's mind, you need to know what their beliefs are. You can't just talk about your own. So when, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses come to my house fairly often, <laughs> it seems. And, um, yeah, first I invite them in. I'm not going to slam a door. And then, you know, we talk about Matthew 25. When you were hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you invite me in? You know, when, when, I, um, was, or when I was a stranger, did you invite me in? Well, when I was in prison, did you visit me? You know, whatever you did to the least. When I was sick, did you attend to me? Whatever you did to the least, my brothers and sisters did. But they, they don't ask whether you're a Jehovah's Witness in that scripture, like Judgment Day. And so we have a conversation about their scriptures, right? So I try to talk to them on, on their terms and try to clarify my commitments and beliefs. But I need to know something about their beliefs. I need to know something about their traditions and their... And I need to be accepting of those differences and accepting of the people behind them. And you know, we, we, we don't have a cult. I think in New Zealand, though, we have a real potential for that culture because it is just kind of not too terribly affected by things. You know? we don't, for reasons that probably have to do with peace history and so forth, people don't tend to get in each other's faces as much as we find elsewhere. Um, so, um, but. My main interest is, in, is you know, in, in studying those things. And then the applied interest, how do we communicate it? How do we, I think we have to give people the correct information. But to do that, we need to break down um, the automatic default assumption that these are core, that these differences that we tell ourselves are important reflect you know, core differences in um, our kind of motivation, in, in our behavior, and in, ultimately in our, um, in our values. Thanks, Joe. Um, I have a question which is kind of related to Selwyn's. Um, going back to your definition at the beginning, uh, which I, I worry about, I know you tend to be provocative, but my worry about it is that, that nobody escapes the net of religion except that admitting they don't have any sense of justice. But the question I had for you, and maybe more of a concern for you, is with this very all-embracing definition of, of religion, um, how are you going to measure things like religious affiliation and disaffiliation? Because, as you said, you know, the atheists haven't given up a sense of justice. So, are yeah. they, have they given up religion then? But not on your definition. So, no, like, um, um, you know, nature is a pretty big category, or biology, or something like, or cells are huge, the huge topic, and. Um, we won't ever come to understand them, probably in human history. And I know, yeah, I know people are working in these areas. And um, so the concept of you know, religion being huge is um, nor normal, I think. Any, and then within those topics, we have very, 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 very small questions of the kind that I've raised in this lecture, and that lead to other questions. That you know, for example, the pattern of variation within denominations does that affect charity? Could be a question that you have. And then you attempt to measure it as best you can with a full appreciation that your measures might not be that good and that you know, your grad students have come along or not, your, your postdocs or, or subsequent colleagues and uh, superiors will come along and just make everything, uh, you know, challenge everything you believe. And, and that becomes incremental. And I think the real benefit of in integrating natural scientific approaches is that there is, behind all of the stuff that people read in the popular literature among the, the 
among no one, among those who aren't doing actual science, but are scientists staking claims, the, the actual science is quite constructive. We do get, like Paul's thesis is a good example of how you can get some improvement in understanding how a body movement can affect your relationship, your prediction about what another person is going to do. Well, then we look at the, the goal structures that underpin this. And then we can then look at the variation in those goals. A, a thousand, you know, a, a, you know, an, a innumerably many tiny questions, you know, appear underneath that. But if we don't, if we don't start with the broader concept, or if we begin to think that the belief thing is going to be the really important differentiator between religious and not religious, which is, I think, the, the way people, you know, tend to move now, I, we're going to miss the what I take to be the the most important questions that scholars of religion. Um, have raised during the past 50 years. There's questions about how people become connected to others. Now, Jeff, I mean, the, I've been looking at scholars of religion. There's a whole philosophical tradition going back to Cicero and um, you know, Augustine, Lucretius, Vero. The, the, the classical world was filled with commentaries about what you ought to do to construct a, a just society. There were Republicans in, in that, you know, monarchists. There were de real debates about the kinds of practices. And within that, a real diversity of um, ideas about what was um, superstition and what was you know, true ethical religion. And then debates about, and uh, in that history as I'm getting to it through Jeff's work, um, uh, thinkers like uh, Aquinas would, would, would look to faith as a gift that you have or you don't. And if you don't have it, it, you can't be held accountable for not having it. If you do, you can be tortured, right? But religion was uh, about that, that aspect of justice. So they had a slightly different conception to the one I'm raising that has to do with our duties and obligations to those we can never repay, unlike the duties and obligations that we have to each other when we can engage in um, um, reciprocal exchange. People like our parents are people we can never repay. But and so we have a debt of obligation to them, which we then embody through a set of ritual practices. And there are debates about duties and obligations to God and then there's a recognition that, you know, the people that are getting encountered, and Jeff goes into great detail about what's caused us in the Americas, they might have semblances of these kind of practices. And a real emphasis on understanding rituals and beliefs and texts and all of that stuff I, we get at in religious studies as fundamental to, to, to the operations of society, right? We don't have that vocabulary anymore. In fact, and the concept of justice, I think, is a weak one and inadequate for many reasons. But it's at least a start that, that can point people in the direction of something they can appreciate. Yeah, I think that's important. And yeah, I'm committed to it for this reason. But what, gives, what, what needs to change for, um, for the world to improve in ways that you think are important? Well, we don't know yet. We have default kind of positions, we argue. But we, we really don't know how these systems come together and work. And what, what do we default to? Is we default to an increasingly um, diffuse and ill-articulated kind of, I, I, I think, largely commercial-driven. And, and by commercial, I mean really just whatever's around us, information-driven kind of morality. And that's what we have, you know, because we haven't thought critically about how we are supported. And then we have a set of values, like, oh, I got to get that, that thing, I got to get that thing, I got to. Uh, in a set of um, blindnesses that come along with those values that, that, um, that is the default state. So I really um, am committed to this um, ethical conception of religion as the starting point for religious studies. Uh, and when we do that, we need, we, we need to like, talk to theologians as well. The, the, I mean, we need to train you know, pe people who, we, as we were talking about earlier, they come into you know, the university, they don't have, they, they, they think of, they have nothing recognizable at the university that can educate them about their faith. They see that as hostile and, and is, um, they see science as a hostile thing and they just don't do it. And they might be, and, yeah. It's not to say that, that there aren't problems in those communities. Again, there's heterogeneity and they're doing things that I would disagree with, but there needs to be much more attentiveness, I think, to that broader complex of, I take them to be natural biocultural phenomena that support ethics. And, 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 and we have our beliefs, or we don't, and, and we, our ethics might vary with the beliefs, they might not, we don't know yet.
but those beliefs are important to people. We should recognize them. They're part of a vocabulary that's um, not just part of our own society, that's been part of human history, and they get expressed in all kinds of ways, um, and um, how, that, how those ways affect people, how that works, we, we, we don't even dimly understand. So like, I think we could be Albert Moore for like maybe 20 years at least, uh, the next 20 years, to even just begin to describe some of these features that I've just listed. You know, how many more did I uh, not, not um, describe? Um, so yeah, but I, I, that is challenging, and I know that in my own department, um, there was, you know, we're under review, and the, the, the justice conception of religion isn't like super popular. <laughs> so. All right, I, I've been told I get. Uh, John said this is the last question, so I apologize. But this is this has been a great talk, and you know I'm a fan of your work. And and, and hearing it all in one venue, uh, there's some questions that occurred to me about, um, it, particularly in relation to my own attempt to to move in a more quantitative direction in my own work. And it, it seems to me that I, I never realized fully until this moment what a true Durkheimian parts of your personality are in the sense that um, you're kind of, it seems to me there's two fundamental convictions that you seem to, to, to have um, that are animating your study. And I wonder if you'd say these are fundamental convictions that those of us who want to do this kind of work also need to have. The first conviction is that religion has been around for a really long time. Yeah. That when we look at evidence of skulls, you know, yeah. you know, dozens of thousands of years ago, what we're looking at is not some kind of other behavior, some kind of symbolic behavior, ritual behavior, but, but a variety of religion. That's the first yeah. conviction. The second conviction, I think, is that religion is evol evolutionarily advantageous. In other words, if you look at the measurements and the hypotheses that are in this, like cooperation, uh, charitable giving, other things, these are, these are um, pro-social and you could say evolutionarily advantageous behaviors, right? So yeah. th those two convictions seem to be at least animating the hypotheses if not other things in the study. And I, I just, I guess I would ask you, can we do this work without those assumptions? And also, is it possible, just as you wonderfully disaggregate uh, a kind of generalized trend in secularization or, or de-religious identification and say, look, there's different things happening here. Is it possible then that you know, there's different things happening as well, that, that religion is consistent, but there's other societal factors um, that are also participating in these, uh, you know, in, in the evolution of large scale societies, for example, that yes, you may have blood sacrifice, but you also have these other factors that, and there's some kind of, it's the synthesis of all these factors that's, that's taking place. And then also let me add, let me, let me ask another question, which is to say, is it also possible then, I think if we start to question, prize apart these two convictions, that there are varieties of religion that are evolutionarily advantageous and varieties which are evolutionarily de disadvantageous? Would you, would you be willing to go that, that There are part? some things that are evolutionarily advantageous that are morally appalling. And you know, like, so that could, just because something helped a group to become successful, right. you know, like inequality, would, could have been extremely effective, you know, in line managing people into doing things they don't want to do. And so um, I don't want to paint. Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't. I think Dur Durkheim was um, um, too too narrow in his conception of beliefs and rights, uh, uh, while at the same time pointed to a set of real questions that has you know kind of been important to the work I've been doing. Um, I don't think you. I think you know the best thing to do is to challenge all of this stuff and to try to develop ways of testing our beliefs and to, to change our views in light of what the evidence is. Now, when we change our views in light of the evidence, it depends on what our prior, what our prior beliefs are. How, how surprised are we to observe something, you know, and how unsurprised are we? And we, we change in rate, in, in, in exact proportion to the amount of surprise. That, that actually can be proved. That's one of the few mathematical things about science. You can you should change your mind in light of the evidence. So say we have a disagreement about um, the role of a particular belief. Say, uh, you know, you think, uh, you know, I think you need to, I think God gives you a certain level of something and someone thinks, no, it could be just spirit. The, it's really the ritual thing. We try to figure out how to test that. And then there are a whole different set of questions about what the practical implications might be. And, you know, and then a whole set of, you know, and, uh, but I, I do think that um, religious studies should take, and, and theology should take a bolder move in um, pointing out how, funda how fundamentally complex and bizarre and, un and uninvestigated 
bizarre from the vantage point of an anthropologist from Mars, Mars might see it, these systems are, that, that actually prop communities up. And we know they do. We've been there. We've been to these communities. We've been to Mauritius. You've seen this stuff. That's all part of what's happening there. It, could it be accidental? Could it be incidental? Yes, those are theories we can test. We can look at the longevity of these things, some of the features of our religions. I could look at the Reformation and see what was retained across those things and not look at the divisions. And are those functional properties, you know, certain sets of texts and beliefs? Were those the things that, you know, and is it morally good? You know, well, I have a sense of justice. I have a sense of, you know, we need, I need to, you need to understand that about me if we're going to have a conversation about it. And, um, you know, more discussion, not less, more understanding of my position, not less, and more understanding of yours. I think that that's the kind of, um, I think that's where we should go. I think Albi, you know, had insights into this, and I think he was right about that. And I think it's where we've been, too. We've been interdisciplinary. We've been the focal place for this. And this particular department has had the theology and yeah, you know, I, I got to talk about how <laughs> it might, you know, it, should it disappear? Like, I, I, I don't think so. Like, I'm, but that's more instinctive on that one. But who's going to train people on the front lines if it's not us? Um, you know, you, you're at least doing the, the big open courses in that. Um, I'm, I'm very um, inspired by, you know, the work that's happening. And I just would be curious to know how I might contribute to making it more relevant, you know, with you folks. Okay, that's it, I guess. Okay. But Please no. join, join me in thank no you. No predetermined beliefs allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Please join me in thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks.